Hi everyone. So this is going to be another part of my lecture which is conservation status of the environments in Malaysia. This is going to be my last lecture for the semester uh, after the threat and conservation of biodiversity. So I hope that after this lecture you could identify the environmental issue in Malaysia generally and Sarawak uh, in particular. And I hope that you could also know the conservation status of environment in Malaysia and Sarawak. And also I hope that you could gain some understanding of the sustainable ecosystem management in Malaysia. So this is going to be uh, separated into few topics. So for topic number one, I will uh, emphasize on the environmental problem in Malaysia and also in Sarawak. In Malaysia, uh, it is actually a still developing country and our population is now uh, around 31 million. Uh, from my previous lecture, we know that the number is actually growing. And the growing number of population means that there will be a lot of uh, energy consumption and also a lot of waste is going to be produced whenever you are consuming uh, resources. So just so you know that the country's dirtiest river are actually all situated in Pasir Gudang. But there has been a reason for that. Uh, there is a lot of mix of sources of the pollution from the industrial sources, uh, from the sewage discharge, and also from the pond and so from the restaurant and workshop nearby. Okay, this year, remember the thing that happened in Pasir Gudang, it makes into major headlines, news, uh, in the newspaper, in the television. It's about uh, a lot of students affected by having a symptom such as vomiting, nausea and also breathing difficulties. And after an investigation being done, it's actually related to the three factories which processes a chemical base. And then for air pollution, uh, we have discussed what we call as the air pollution index. Uh, that come with the, with the number. So, uh, most of the time, the haze that actually happened here in Malaysia is not originally uh, from our country. It's usually from the neighboring countries because some of them still uh, apply the technique of slash and burn for easy management of the crop which is actually not good for the environment so we call this as a transboundary pollution and also some something happened in Cameron Highland uh, where the illegal farming in Cameron Highland is actually affecting the raw water supply uh, by uh, leaching out of the insecticide and also the fertilizer from the farm to the raw water supply so this is also could become a problem okay taking Sarawak uh, we also have experienced some environmental issues. Uh, yearly, this thing should uh, always happen, uh, which is the haze and smog. Smog is smoke and also fog. Uh, <coughs> this could be due to from open burning, uh, natural burns, or from the peatland. And also, we also experience habitat loss due to deforestation, logging. I think we had discussed how much money the Sarawak made from the timber export. Uh, plantation, which is some uh, usually always monoculture, for example, um, the palm oil plantation, and then we know that Sarawak has a lot of dam, 
and whenever you want to construct a dam you have to clear cut everything so that uh, actually could uh, making the ha uh, habitat loss so haze uh, I think this is uh, what we call as a transboundary pollution uh, meaning that the smoke travel from one country to another which travel thousands of miles through Southeast Asia so usually this is because of a thousand of square miles of uh, rainforest, plantation, forest uh, actually being burned uh, I think I mentioned this as uh, slash and burn technique uh, when, whenever they want to start a new plantation so the cheapest way and the easiest is actually you cut down everything and then you burn it so you need not to process all those waste but then this is actually uh, <coughs> very disastrous okay, for both nature and also human so these are uh, <coughs> some of the records and then yes Unimas uh, or Sarawak we actually had been declared a state of emergency uh, so all the class all the uh, outdoor activities has actually been uh, uh, postponed okay it's all being, being cancelled just like what we are experiencing now uh, I know that uh, highway project is something good for the future but then we one have to remember that in order for you to make the highway you have to cut down all the trees to make way and then just from this picture you can see that you're actually making uh, a way uh, you're actually separating the forest and I think we learned about how uh, forest fragmentation can actually be a threat like, to the biodiversity and then if you can look at the slope uh, they're actually cutting the slope uh, it used to be trees over there but then now there's no more uh, yeah this is actually could be part of the environmental issue and then deforestation this could be for so many uh, reasons okay I think we discussed about this it can be for uh, uh, agriculture it can be for development and so on so in Borneo uh, if you can take a look at uh, the top right so from the 1950s someone actually like mapping how much trees that we have uh, and then until the year 2020 it is actually getting less and lesser so I know that we need to develop but this kind of thing need to be uh, control, in control okay uh, for habitat loss due to agricultural conversion uh, we can see this quite common here in Malaysia and also in Sarawak where all the rainforest has been cleared to make way for the oil palm plantation so for topic 2 uh, this one I'm going to uh, concern on the conservation status of the environment so to do this uh, actually we have been uh, introduced to the concept of uh, totally protected areas in Malaysia so we have we discussed about this during my early lecture that Malaysia is one of the mega diverse countries in the world because we are situated uh, around the equatorial line so we have a quite wealth of biological diversity terrestrial and also the marine zone so in order to, to guard this uh, significant biodiversity we uh, Malaysia uh, under the law we have actually established a network of protected areas or what, what we call as a PAs protected areas so in uh, Peninsula Malaysia we have like four uh, protected areas network that covering around 2.98 million hectares and this actually being managed by different agencies uh, which are the Department of Wildlife and National Parks uh, what we call as a Pehilitan uh, Johor National Park Corporation, Perak State Corporation and also some of the State Forestry Department so this is just to name uh, a few uh, <coughs> the thing about this uh, protected area sometimes they actually under different networks we can govern by different laws which uh, quite uh, can be confusing okay, because they actually uh, varying degrees of protection status and gazetting and also the gazetting procedure gazetting means that uh, under the law it's been written that the place the designated place or area is actually being protected by law so it's like uh, an official statement so that is actually what the gazette uh, means so these are just to show you uh, 
a few of the lists okay of the state and national park in Malaysia so just so you know national park uh, doesn't necessarily means only on the terrestrial okay uh, it can also be part of the um, marine uh, as well so let's say in Pahang we have this one Taman Negara which is among one of the famous one and then in Pera we have this Royal Belum State Park uh, <coughs> and then for example Kedah okay uh, although people go to Kedah Langkawi just for their uh, duty free shopping but just so you know Langkawi is one of the known UNESCO Geopark all the geological formation there is actually very old and uh, they have been studied very well okay for Sarawak we have 42 national park in total uh, this is the most in uh, Malaysia and we only open 13 to, to the visit for the visitors to visit the first three here that we mentioned you guys had visited this uh, Bakun National Park, Kuba National Park and also Satubu National Park uh, I think you guys visiting uh, this place for uh, your uh, colloquium yeah. and the rest is actually the other 10 uh, National Park which is open for visitors uh, as what you can see uh, I mentioned here that there are actually 565,000 uh, hectare of land that been protected Okay. However, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it is not only uh, uh, terrestrial land, but we also um, protect marine uh, part as well. So one of the example is like the Talang Sata National Park. It is actually an island, but since it is actually a turtle nesting area, so part of the marine area is actually also being protected. And we have this one um, national park. Okay, it's called uh, Miri Sibuti uh, National Park. So the coral reef that is actually being protected. So this is uh, <coughs> contribute to the two hundred thirty one thousand uh, of hectare. Okay, of protected area. So I think by now you guys know that uh, Sarawak which is uh, in the island of Borneo high level of endemism and then that makes the flora and fauna here is so special so something that we need to be to be done to conserve and also to manage the Sarawak native flora and fauna in their native habitat uh, <coughs> so all of this effort okay we need to protect and also manage the appropriate areas of natural habitat so this one uh, is not like we randomly choose an area and we protect it and also manage it it's not like that uh, a real re real there must be a real reason why the place is actually being protected for example like Bako it happened to be the natural habitat for the proboscis monkey okay, which is added a bit to Borneo so that is why the place is being protected and for Kubah National Park uh, it is actually being protected because of uh, there's a water catchment area over there and then for Santubong uh, it has this uh, cultural value uh, because of the uh, legend of uh, Putri Santubong uh, with the Sarawak uh, folklore and <coughs> other than the effort to conserve the environment in Sarawak we also have to promote the public education and also the appreciation of nature and this can be done uh, through a promotional campaign uh, from books reading okay or followed from the advertisement this can also be done or like you guys uh, having a or receive a normal education okay um, throughout the classes and last one we can also enforce the relevant legislation which is law enforcement so this is uh, the last one uh, is actually being done by the Sarawak Forestry okay uh, partly but in some other uh, let's say in Peninsula Malaysia this will be done by the Pehilitan so for the uh, environment conservation effort in Sarawak 
we actually had established uh, quite a number of uh, we call it totally protected areas okay uh, which is TPAs so TPA is the area that are maintained in a natural state and are close to extractive use so extractive use here uh, meaning that you cannot mine there you cannot uh, lock the timber to be used or convert it to monetary values so this is actually the, me the meaning behind this extractive uses So there are three types of totally protected areas. So the first one is national parks, uh, nature reserve, and the last one is actually wildlife sanctuaries. So for this national park, uh, how you define this national park is an area of land, inland water or territorial water established under the national park and nature reserve ordinance. Okay, uh, this is what I mean by it's not only a terrestrial land but inland water or also territorial water so the reason for this is also of course for habitat and biodiversity conservation and then you can do this for research this is what the thing that you have been doing uh, when you went to Cuba, Santubong and also Baco uh, okay and then it is also to protect the natural scenic beauty historical sites and monument uh, okay, for this number three uh, you can relate this with Santubong uh, National Park and the last one I think this is one apply to all the national parks okay because when we go there the public can appreciate enjoy and also educating themselves so nature reserve so uh, <coughs> the differences between nature reserve and also the national park is about the pr uh, protected area sizes in hectares so uh, it serves all the same uh, objective okay with the national park but the differences is that the size is actually smaller any of the totally protected areas if they are smaller uh, or less than 1000 hectares so we don't call them national park we call them as a nature reserve so here in Sarawak we have a uh, wind cave and fairy cave. Uh, this is situated in Bau. Maybe one day you can just uh, make a visit over here. And the last one is actually the wildlife sanctuary. So sanctuary uh, <coughs> compared to national park and also nature reserve, they are actually more specific because it's actually a sanctuary for what kind of animal that they, they wish to protect. So because of this, the public access is actually very limited. Uh, so meaning that no commercial tourism is allowed. Uh, meaning that uh, you cannot go there and not spend overnight there. Uh, except for, uh, usually for research, you are actually uh, allowed to go there. But all, <coughs> uh, the, this is actually the differences between uh, wildlife sanctuaries with both National Park and also Nature Reserve. So the public access is strictly limited. So function of totally protected areas, uh, of course the first one is for the environmental protection uh, to protect the natural environment from any threats. So the any threats can be, uh, at, uh, like I always say, always from the human activities. So another function is to conserve the habitat and also the biodiversity. So conserve the habitat of organism for survival of species or to avoid extinction. Uh, this is you can relate with the um, Baku National Park uh, that used to protect and conserve the habitat of proboscis monkey. And sometimes uh, <coughs> the area need to be protected because of their natural beauty. So uh, we learn this from the value of biodiversity. So whenever you get the awe or the sense of uh, impressiveness okay, or from the natural beauty that it has to offer then something needs to be done to protect that area and one of the good things uh, I mean being here in Sarawak is of course the place that it has been protected you can actually do some kind of like uh, environmental education also scientific research Okay, for this number five, protection of area and local culture and spiritual significant. Okay, you can relate this with the uh, again uh, Gunung Santubong. 
and number six is actually ap applies to all the national park for place for outdoor activities and also to promote tourism we also have discussed about how much money that the eco tourism uh, could generate uh, for the state or for the country itself so these are some of the legislation and policy uh, but don't worry uh, you need not to know all of this but we actually did uh, touch about the national parks at 1980 the number six here okay this is actually the the act that we used to uh, govern the laws of all the national parks in uh, some uh, in peninsular Malaysia the first of our legislation and policy we have our own uh, legislation and also law so we have water ordinance Sarawak reverse ordinance uh, and then we also have Sarawak biodiversity center ordinance okay so these are part of the um, law uh, or ordinance that being used to protect the area 